it's a subject that we will only begin to explore today, and especially the issues of privatization. We might begin by noting that in the Constitution there is a particular element of privatization with reference to the Congress's authorization to issue letters of mark, that is to undertake a privatized form of warfare. And in the uh, 18th century, that was quite common. And that reminds us that the Constitution itself was written at a point when the mercantilist system was coming to an end, a system which itself included a great deal of privatization simply because governments could not bear the financial burden of the various things they thought that only governments could undertake. And with the great progress of economic science in the 18th century, the discovery that, in fact, uh, the private uh, realm is what produces the wealth that any government uh, extracts to carry out its activities. And it's only in the 20th century with what has been a marked decline in economic science and perhaps perhaps also political wisdom that we've seen the reemergence of mercantilism and then once again the, the reappearance of what historians know so well, the crisis of the state, the crisis of the fiscal system, and with it a, the crisis of attempting to fit a legal system into that form of mercantilism. Our first speaker for this last session will be Professor Robert Ellickson from Stanford Law School. When one speaks uh, late on a Saturday afternoon, one hopes to be armed with a number of provocative uh, statements. Um, I think I have at least one provocative statement, and it is essentially this, I'll give it to you in preview, that the intellectual structure of our symposium uh, is deeply contradictory with the ideals of the Federalist Society. That the Federalist Society has fallen prey to the Beltway Syndrome in putting together the intellectual structure of our symposium. Uh, since that's my only uh, really provocative idea, I will hold uh, describing the contents of the idea to the end of my talk, uh, but, but I will try to flesh that out uh, for you. Uh, there are a number of things to talk about in the public and private realms and privatization. There's actually quite a good book uh, called How Shall We Collect the Garbage? Uh, improbable title for a book, but it's really quite a good book talking about contracting out city provision and whatever. Uh, that will not be the thrust of my remarks. Uh, the, art, the discussion of the merits of public or private provision in specific sectors, uh, that's not to uh, belittle that topic, but I think it's not particularly well connected to the general subject uh, of this symposium, which is constitutional law. As I understand it, my two co-panelists may uh, speak, uh, make no comments at all about the Constitution, and that uh, means that I feel additional burdens to, to tie in my segment anyway with uh, constitutional matters. Uh, I should say this is something of a challenge for me since I do not regard this as my strong suit, a constitutional interpretation. I teach things like torts and zoning and things of that sort. So uh, I'll give it a shot at any rate. And the way I will articulate the problem is this. If one is someone who wants to socialize more of the economy, let's say you're a Michael Harrington and the Young Socialists, or you're Jerry Frug, who is a critical legal scholar at the Harvard Law School, and you want cities to operate banks and insurance companies, uh, one constitutional question is, is there anything in the structure of the federal constitution or state constitution uh, that stands in the way of your particular program? So I'll talk about that. Conversely, I will talk about possible constitutional limits on the program of folks who want to move in the other direction. Uh, Stuart Butler and the Heritage Foundation. Robert Poole and Reason Magazine. Uh, they would like to have the prisons run by uh, uh, private entrepreneurs. Uh, are there constraints in the federal constitution or state constitution against their particular agenda? So I will describe a little constitutional law as I understand it. This is, as we say, uh, around Hyde Park, strictly positive analysis of how the law is. I will have very little to say about what the constitutional law should look like in this area, in part because I do not regard myself as a constitutional theorist of great depth. Uh, 
you could imagine uh, fairly strict constitutional constraints on the size of the public and private sector. Our constitution could incorporate the social statics of some public finance theorists, Richard Musgrave, James Buchanan, Robert Nozick, whoever you want, and mandate that government provide certain services and mandate that government not provide the rest and that they be in the private sector. We could have constitutional rules of that sort. My general thesis describing the constitutional law as it currently exists is that we live in a very different world from that, that there is an enormous amount of play uh, in the Constitution in the allocation of responsibilities among these sectors, uh, and I will say a little bit about that uh, normatively. Uh, let me describe first uh, the, uh, the constitutional constraints as I see it on um, uh, the achievement of Michael Harrington's program or Jerry Frug's program to socialize more activities. Are there constitutionally, constitutional requirements that certain things be provided by the private sector? In doing my analysis, I'll talk first about power issues, that is what the Constitution says about the allocation of powers, and then I will describe the rights provisions of the constitutions because they may de facto result in certain power allocations among sectors. In the powers provisions of the federal constitution, and I have a great, I had a great benefit this week. My daughter, who's in sixth grade, brought home a free copy of the constitution, which are being liberally distributed thanks to Warren Burger these days. And I had a chance to scan that in more detail than I have in recent years. I did look through that to see if there are any specific provisions of the federal constitution which deny government the power to enter certain enterprises. And I found only one. I'd be interested in if members of the audience or my co-panelists can come up with others. The one I found is religion. That particular kind of enterprise cannot be entered into by government. I found no other specific uh, denials of power to enter. The federal constitution, on the other hand, does list specific limited powers of the federal government in Article I, Section 8 primarily, and that could de facto be read to mean that those things not listed uh, cannot be exercised by the federal government at any rate, although they could be reserved to the states. Uh, I shall tell you, and I'm sure this would appall Richard Epstein, uh, but the reality is that is not the way uh, Article I has been construed by the Supreme Court. And this is not recent mischief of the Warren Court or something like this. This goes way back. Uh, the early blows were McCullough against Maryland. Uh, and whatever, basically, Article I has been construed, the Article I powers have been construed very liberally, and you can read this as a political, uh, a, a, a Supreme Court uh, decision that basically Congress shall define the scope of federal powers. So there are not major constraints there uh, other than the relationship to ba make another bailout from the ESOPs to the federal government. And if those, okay, let me talk a little bit now about state enterprise. And again, there are very few. They're slightly powers. They do not have limited powers. Uh, I do not have plenary powers. They do not, it may horrify people in this room, but we have a state that runs a bank, North Dakota, Wisconsin. Uh, and there's nothing in the state constitutions which fail to confer those, which are in state constitutions and also in the federal constitutions, uh, for example. Uh, the rights that exist to people against the individual rights people may have against a delegation to private parties, I think do exist, but again, they are overcome, they, they can be overcome. I use the example of prisons because that is currently a matter of interest, and in fact, we have several dozen programs where contractors have been hired to conduct, uh, to, to, to manage prisons. Um, there are a couple of recent notes in the Yale Law Journal on this by talented students, and what they say basically, there is no, they never even talk about a possible uh, bar on the delegation to pri uh, the, the management of prisons, but they do say that the Eighth Amendment involving cruel and unusual punishments and the Due Process Clause constrain the manner in which these things are delegated. So there's no doubt that sometimes functions have to be delegated in a certain way because of contribution, uh, constitutional uh, provisions. Uh, I will uh, be very brief in my normative assessment of, of, of all this. Uh, as I say, I think, I'm sure Richard uh, Epstein would be appalled by it. Uh, I do think it is fair to say, and the constitutional scholars among you can, can challenge me on this, I can't think of a justice in the last 50 years since McReynolds stepped down who basically disagreed with the proposition that, the, that Congress defines the basic scope of federal powers. Uh, I think that has been unanimously agreed to by most of the justices, uh, with the possible exception where state rights were concerned in cases like uh, uh, usury. So this is extremely well-established constitutional law at the federal uh, level. 
Okay, that's uh, my uh, description. If you're interested in my normative view about possible constitutional amendments to adopt somebody's social aesthetics, like Rich, uh, Richard Nozick's, or I'm sorry, Robert Nozick's, or uh, Michael Harrington's, or whatever, in the Constitution, I, I may have some ideas about that. Uh, now I uh, stray away from constitutional law to make two points about uh, privatization matters, which are non-constitutional. The first one is this. Most of the incentives for the public provision of certain activities, I think, arise through the general structure of our fiscal systems. In particular, our spending policies and our tax policies. And if somebody believes in the cause of privatization, as I do uh, substantially, uh, the best reform one can undertake is to change the general structure of these fiscal systems. Example. The ability of private schools to compete with public schools very much depends upon the structure of state and federal aids that go to school systems. If private school systems are not uh, eligible for various state equalization grants or whatever, obviously private schools will not be able to compete well with public schools. And those spending programs are essential to the dominance of the current public school system. Similarly, there are things in the Internal Revenue Code which greatly encourage the public provision of things, particularly at the state and local level. Why do cities build our stadiums these days? It is substantially uh, connected to the exemption from income of interest on municipal bonds. It is a lot to do with uh, uh, the deductibility of state and local taxes from income, whereas uh, contributions to various private associations are not deductible. In my state, California, Homeowners associations sometimes incorporate as cities simply because they get tax deductions that way. Uh, the current cliche is that in tax matters, a level playing field is appropriate. Uh, I suggest if you're interested in privatization, a level playing field in the fiscal system would do a lot for the cause of privatization. Uh, very briefly, let me, uh, so it's will set up Ken Abraham in one of his, uh, he wants to be provocative this afternoon. I have to set him up with this comment. Uh, so we can talk about anarchists in our midst. So let me do this briefly, Ken, although I'm a little bit toward the end of my time. Um, I think privatization can proceed more profoundly than it is sometimes thought that it can proceed. And I'll give the examples of the people who have not recognized the power of the private sector, people like Ronald Coase and Robert Nozick, who you would agree, I think, are improbable examples of people who want to centralize power in the state. Uh, these people are, I think, what I would call legal centralists. In his famous article on social costs, Ronald Coase assumed that when you need, you need a system of property rights, and he assumed that all property rights inherently must be established by the state. The state establishes property rights, then we let people trade them. Similarly, uh, in his uh, famous book, uh, uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, Nozick uh, basically says, we need the state, the night watchman state, to enforce our rules because self-help enforcement is anarchic, will lead to a lot of uh, carnage out there, and basically the state has an essential function of keeping uh, uh, the public order. Uh, my own view is that these statements as an empirical matter are both flat false, that in fact we have in our society much more decentralized ways of making rules and enforcing rules. Uh, an example I like, to do, I like to use when I teach property is the rules we have for the allocation of basketball courts, uh, public basketball courts, in pickup games. There are, in fact, very powerful sets of rules. We have in George Priest, I should say, an experienced Sandlot basketball player, and he can enrich our understanding of this. But they're very powerful sets of rules that allocate informal property rights and who gets the court at various times. Those do not arise, contrary to coast, those do not arise from the state and they are not enforced by gendarmes. They are enforced through other more informal and I think very successful methods. Uh, if you believe that this, which is the ultimate system of decentralization, is a good thing, uh, basically as a judge or an attorney, you push for the use of custom uh, as a source of authority in uh, common law doctrine and also in statutes, the way the UCC uh, does it. I don't happen to think custom is always, in all its, all its manifestations, the best source of authority. I think there are many cases, I think in basketball courts, for example, it, works out quite well as a way of allocating space. Okay, my last comment is the one that I provided you a teaser with, which is why the structure of today's program is deeply subversive to what I would regard as the goals of the Federalist Society 
uh, they have fallen prey to the Beltway Syndrome, the last organization you would hope to succumb to this particular phenomenon. And it's this, it's been implied in several of the remarks I say, have said. If you look at your program, there's no reason to do it because this is manifestly true. It refers many times to the Constitution, uh, the Constitution. We do not have one Constitution in this country. We have 50 state constitutions. Most of our speakers have talked as if the only constitutional rules we have in this country are the federal constitutional rules. There have been two notable exceptions. I think Frank Easterbrook took the state seriously, and I think Craig Stubblebine did because he mentioned that California, in fact, has very elaborate sets of rules on fiscal policies within the state of California. But if we are serious federalists, we should not regard the ultimate source of our rules to be uh, those people who make the laws and interpret our rules that live within the Beltway. Uh, this, uh, this federal society could choose as, and I try to think of what the appropriate topic for the next um, uh, seminar would be, which would be more uh, congruent with uh, idealized uh, federalist principles. Basically, what we want to do is see how Utah or New Hampshire could flourish on their own and show up their neighbors, uh, Massachusetts and California and whatever, as people vote with their feet to go there and whatever. So I thought of some topics such as, this. I wish this was funny, it's not, uh, but it's about encouraging uh, diversity among states or something like that. This strikes me as a much more consonant with the uh, fundamental aims and worldview of the Federalist Society rather than the notion that we're looking for a nationally uniform sets of constitutional rules on various matters. Thank you. George Priest of Yale Law School will speak on Sandlot Ball and Spontaneous Order Law. <laughs> I'd love to talk about basketball, and especially the way I make rules uh, on, the, uh, on the courts as an example of private order. Uh, but but uh, instead, I, I, uh, I want to talk about a different subject. I, as Bob indicated, I'm not going to talk about the the Constitution itself, but rather about uh, an important set of government activities uh, in the, in the uh, society. Uh, and and I'm, I'm going to argue that various of these government activities, which I think go to, are, are among the most basic uh, of, of uh, justifications uh, for government activity, uh, are in fact uh, contrary, contravene the, the ambitions of the programs and activities themselves. And I think, and I'm going to argue, that these programs directly increase uh, the level of uh, losses in the society, both economic losses, which we've been addressing, but even in this case, physical or, or even in some cases, psychological uh, losses, uh, and so uh, really have to be rethought in terms of appropriate uh, activities for the federal government or for a, for a state government. The Constitution, as it is currently interpreted, does not prevent the state from increasing losses or injuries in this way. One, one could imagine a constitution uh, that would be interpreted uh, to, to, uh, uh, to prevent these uh, actions, uh, but, but uh, it, it isn't that way now. The grounds of my critique, though, go beyond the, the grounds that most of us are familiar with in criticizing governmental activity. It goes beyond efficiency, certainly includes efficiency, but goes beyond efficiency, and it goes beyond even the, the advocacy of, of uh, personal liberty. Uh, I think there are, there are independent moral grounds for rejecting this realm of government uh, activity. And, and in a way, the independent moral grounds are obvious and embraced by the affirmative goals of the activities themselves. There, there are few moral systems uh, that promote increasing the rate of, say, physical injury. Uh, it's not hard to defend uh, this point. I, if I have time, although uh, I don't think I will during these initial remarks, perhaps in the questions, uh, I might also discuss how this approach redefines the affirmative role of government. Uh, it, it leads to a different theory of public goods and I think a much more constrained theory. And it suggests as well a different structure of the provision of public uh, governmental services in the nature of what we call public goods and much greater reliance on, on user charges and discriminations of one, uh, one type or another. But again, I'm going to put that off uh, to the discussion if we have time. Now, the way I want to approach this, this view of the state is to analyze the role of the government as an insurer or as a risk spreader, 
as we all know, it, it, is a, it is an important part of the folklore of policy analysis that ultimately the government is the, uh, is the best and most effective risk spreader or insurer in the society. And just to, just to establish that point, although again, I think it's well known, let me quote from, from the dean of my law school, my good friend Guido Calabrese, whose relationship with this society, regrettably, has never extended beyond the genetic. Uh, Guido, Guido writes in his famous book, Cause of Accidents, if we are concerned solely or principally with diminishing social and economic dislocations, then a generalized system of social insurance covering all types of severe injuries would be the only practical answer. Payments into the social insurance fund could be spread as widely as possible or allocated to those especially able to pay. Again, a very, uh, very familiar uh, view and one which Guido has, has largely, and many others have largely uh, made their uh, careers upon. Now, now the, the idea, of course, extends beyond, beyond Guido and beyond the area of, of tort law uh, that, that Guido was talking about. Indeed, this idea of the government as the insurer might be said to be the central underlying conception of the New Deal, uh, whose principal programs were, were designed uh, quite uh, overtly to address the uh, dislocations of the Depression and to spread the risks, the risks or the losses that had been suffered or that might be suffered in the future over the society as a whole. The Reconstruction Finance uh, Corporation, the Federal Farm Mortgage Corporation, the Federal Emergency Relief Act, even later in the late New Deal, the FDIC, among others, all of these programs had as, a, as an underlying philosophy that the government, the state, could act as the most effective insurer uh, of the losses that, that might be uh, suffered, and the state should act in that a particular way. And of course, since the New Deal, there has been the, the insurance activities of the government uh, have become massive. Social security, loan guarantees, the, the safety net uh, in, in the various social welfare programs that constitute the safety net are just other examples. Uh, medical uh, care through, uh, through Medicaid, even income maintenance is a, is a form of, of uh, insurance for uh, the possibility of, of uh, losing income. And all are justified in terms of the scope and scale of uh, the superior scope and scale of governmental activities. Uh, the activities, uh, are, I'm sorry, the scope and scale of social activities, the scope of the society over which the government can spread the risks, and of course the enormous scale of the government as providing a form of uh, efficiency, risk efficiency and risk administration. Um, now, I think when, you, when one thinks about this question of what these advantages of the government really are, again, they're widely thought to be spreading over a large range of activities uh, and, and taking advantage of, uh, of administrative uh, savings. Uh, the, the, uh, one has reason to be initially suspicious because uh, one would, uh, if there are these substantial economies of scope and scale in government insurance, uh, one would think uh, they, they ought to be observed, uh, perhaps on a smaller scale, but at least observed in the private sector that the government has not yet uh, taken over. But when you look at the private insurance sector, you see nothing of the kind. In every private casualty insurance market, uh, the, the uh, scale of operations are characterized by very small uh, market shares of even the largest firms. The largest firm uh, in uh, property and casualty, offering property and casualty insurance in the United States, has a bare 10% of the market which of course is not strong uh, support for the, for the uh, greater advantages of large scale and scope in the operation of insurance. But it seems to me when you look more carefully at how insurance operates uh, to reduce the risk level, one can see why the government is inferior to the private market of insurance, not only in efficiency terms, in cost terms, but also in moral terms, in terms of reducing the rate of injury. Take the, the, the very common uh, statement uh, of uh, government advantage in terms of aggregating uh, risks. Again, the idea here is that the, because the state is the largest social entity uh, in terms of the activities over which it has jurisdiction, in terms of the generations over which it has uh, jurisdiction, that it's able to spread risks uh, most ably over, over these uh, and most easily over these uh, wide range of activities. Now, look at that. Think about that aggregation function, the aggregation of, of, uh, of risks uh, for purposes of spreading. Insurance reduces the risk level, what we mean by spreading. Insurance reduces the risk level by aggregating independent uncorrelated risks uh, in order to, uh, can to, to have these risks, the risk terms of each of these risks uh, cancel out. It takes advantage of the law of large numbers 
Uh, and uh, these, this proposition about insurance is uh, well known. The, the, the argument for application to the government sphere is because the government incorporates a wide range of activities, it's best able to aggregate risks and have them, uh, have them con cancel out. But as everyone knows by, uh, that has read even the most casual Harris or, or Gallup poll, the law of large numbers becomes operative at very, very quickly with, with really very small absolute numbers. Pollsters can accurately predict voting behavior of 80 million voters from a sample of 1,400 uh, individuals. And as a consequence, it's, it's, it is uh, unnecessary to aggregate risk pools of 200 million taxpayers. Or if you add the generations, 400 million taxpayers or 600 million potential taxpayers to spread risks effectively. If one looks at the other uh, ways in which insurance operates, this, this, this same, uh, this same uh, point, these same points can be made, but in fact can be made uh, more, stronger, more strongly. When one looks at the other aspects of uh, insurance behavior, the size and the state and the size and the scope of uh, of the state and our and the constitutional restrictions that we put upon the state make the state largely inferior to private insurance companies and the market in reducing the level of risk. The second most important function of an insurer uh, is to control moral hazard. Moral hazard refers to how the existence of insurance alters the incentives to, to increase uh, the level of risky activity or to increase the number of claims upon insurance. Private insurers, as all of us know from looking at our, uh, at, uh, at our health policies, uh, control moral hazard by collecting deductibles, uh, by uh, incorporating coinsurance provisions in policies, and by specific limitations of coverage, all of which have the effect of reducing uh, the risk level and ultimately the injury level. Now, the government as an insurer se se seldom makes such efforts. Some government programs incorporate small deductibles and coinsurance, but the extent to which the government as insurer relies upon these uh, insurance techniques is much less. As a consequence, every study of state insurance activity shows the moral hazard problems to be uh, severe. Government loan guarantees uh, lead to, lead to uh, the selection of more risky investments. Retirement insurance leads to, uh, leads to choices for earlier retirement. Unemployment insurance uh, increases unemployment periods. And the higher the unemployment benefits, the larger the increase in unemployment periods. Now, the third uh, major uh, role for, for an insurer in reducing risk is in the control of adverse selection. Private insurers control adverse selection by selecting low-risk individuals for, uh, and, and segregating these low-risk individuals from the high risk in order to offer the low risk, low premiums, lower premiums to, ins to increase insurance availability to them. These differential premiums encourage the high risk individuals or high risk activities to reduce the extent of this risky activity. And as I say, conversely, extend insurance av availability to the low risk who might not otherwise engage in the activity at all. That's private insurance. Government insurance typically engages in no efforts to control adverse selection. The federal deposit insurance uh, a corporation uh, is only the most notorious uh, recent example. Controlling adverse selection uh, requires the careful discrimination among risks, and the state for constitutional and, and sometimes political reasons uh, frequently refuses to discriminate uh, in these uh, dimensions. There is a related financing effect here too to the operation of insurance. What we're interested in with respect to insurance is reducing the effective consequences of risky activity. Private insurers achieve this end by charging pre premiums according to the estimated risk of the activity. The higher the risk, the, the higher the premium. And then they take these premiums and invest the premiums as productively as possible to, again, increase as much as possible the productive resources against which those who are injured uh, can draw. Now, government insurance goes about this in exactly the opposite way. Because of the government's inability or reluctance to discriminate among risks, Government insurance seldom is self-supporting and often must draw from general revenues to support, uh, to support its insurance programs. Again, the recent bailout of the farm credit system is an example, but it's a perverse example from the standpoint of insurance. In a progressive tax system, the government ends up taxing most heavily, of course, the most productive activities of the society. Uh, but, but for insurance purposes, uh, taxing the most productive activities of the, of, of, the, of the society to support what are essentially subsidies to the most risky activities of the society, again, gets it exactly wrong. Private insurers, in contrast, 
tax, uh, tax uh, premiums, uh, raise, uh, tax their premiums, uh, raise their funds, uh, most heavily from the riskiest activities of the society in order to invest their premiums uh, in the most productive activities uh, of the society. Now, the state is ineffective as, as an insurer for very simple reasons. Uh, effective risk reduction, effective insurance to achieve risk reduction is, achieved by, is obtained by essentially market discipline, by differential charges according to risk levels, by constraints on benefits to control moral hazard, by discrimination uh, in narrow risk pool definition to control adverse selection and by investing premiums aggressively in the most productive social activities. Private insurers are rewarded in the marketplace according to their abilities to reduce societal risks in these ways. In contrast, the state, and for very good reasons, is unable to engage in any of these forms of market discipline. The size and necessary inclusiveness of government obstructs optimal risk aggregation. The state's commitment to non-discrimination prevents control of adverse selection. The political responsiveness of the state to voter interests and benefits cripples efforts to control moral hazard. As a result, the state can do little to reduce risk levels. Now, there are two propositions here. The first is an obvious one, that there are great efficiency losses from the provision of insurance by the government. But the second is, is, is a different one. There is, I think, an independent moral ground for resisting government insurance uh, activities over the very large measure of government activity. These activities increase the less risk level and increase the level of injuries and losses to the society. Too often, critics of governmental activities, after, after making this efficiency point, invoke only the values of, of individual liberty, uh, which, of course, the supporters of greater governmental activities are willing to sacrifice in order to redistribute uh, wealth to favored groups. But there is another dimension to the analysis. There, there are re very real losses uh, being suffered uh, here. Workers' compensation insurance, by limiting the extent by government constraints on the extent of experience rating in order to redistribute wealth to small firms increases the number of worker injuries. There are numerous empirical studies, all of which point in the same direction. Government assigned risk pools and joint underwriting authorities, which again, redistribute wealth openly toward risky activities. Uh, in fact, the riskiest activities of the society directly increase the accident rate. Government disability insurance, because it does not control moral hazard, uh, and adverse selection, increases the number of disabling injuries. Government unemployment insurance increases periods of unemployment. Loan guarantees increase the willingness to take investment risks, and more importantly, increase the rate of defaults. These various government activities are often justified, or there have been attempts, uh, in effect, successful, to justify them by the redistributive ends uh, that insurance is very well adapted uh, to achieve. Uh, much of the debate over these activities has been dominated by the arid terms of trade-offs between equity and efficiency, which all of us are familiar. But I think that scholars skeptical of government activities should not concede the moral ground, the equity ground. The, redistri the redistributional goals of government insurance are paid for by the increased level of injuries and losses to the society. And in this context, uh, and in the context of insurance for losses of this nature, the moral superiority lies not with the government, but with the marketplace, because of the superior methods of the marketplace to reduce the level of societal risks and reduce the level of injuries to its citizens. Thank you. Our last official speaker for this program is Kenneth Abraham, University of Virginia Law School. Well, I too have to start with some disclaimers. I, not only do I not know uh, much about constitutional law, I don't know very much about privatization. Uh, and it's not clear to me why uh, I was invited to be on this panel other than the fact that uh, Gene Meyer, when he, when he spoke with me, said that he needed somebody to counterbalance uh, 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 George and Bob. Uh, uh, so I guess I'm the designated centrist, uh, uh, but, but the, uh, the, what they've had to say seems so uh, sensible to me that it's hard to imagine how to go about counter counterbalancing them. Uh, so I sat down to think about uh, what I would say, and I was reminded of the, the uh, tale of the wise old owl and the uh, centipede in the forest. The centipede went to the wise old owl because he had trouble coordinating all his legs, 
And he said, wise old owl, wise old owl, what should I do? I can't get all my legs to work uh, together. And the owl thought for a moment. And he said, well, turn yourself into a fish. So the centipede went back to his place in the forest. Uh, and he tried very hard to turn himself into a fish, but he had difficulty uh, accomplishing the, the uh, goal. And his friend said, well, go back to the owl and ask him uh, what you should do. So he went back to the owl. And he said, wise old owl, wise old owl, what should I do? You said that I should turn myself into a fish, and I can't do it. How should I do it? And the owl thought again. And he looked down at the centipede, and he said, how the hell should I know? I just make policy. <laughs> so I decided to, to uh, uh, make my talk largely descriptive and positive rather than normative, uh, and to be uh, uh, more particular uh, 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 than general. My uh, subject of interest also is insurance. Uh, but let me start uh, briefly with a point about privatization and the privatization notion uh, itself. Uh, the movement of some of the functions uh, that are now performed by government into the private uh, sector, uh, I think may or may not uh, enhance uh, economic liberty. And therefore, we ought to be, uh, uh, be a little bit um, selective about the notion of privatization itself. For example, we could uh, displace some of the command and control uh, regulation of uh, uh, environmentally uh, risky activity uh, that we now uh, find uh, uh, under the federal environmental laws with uh, emission taxes that uh, allow the market to uh, uh, set its own optimal levels of air pollution. Uh, but if the emission taxes are set very high, then there's greater economic liberty on paper only. Uh, and the privatization idea really hasn't accomplished very much. Similarly, I see uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General Willard in the, off in the uh, audience. Uh, he spent a good deal of time looking at the effects of tort law uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, and the economy. Uh, tort law can be understood as a more private version of a, of a government regulation uh, of safety since it leaves decisions as to the appropriate uh, level of care to those who are threatened with liability. But uh, as we've seen in the past several years, if the tort regime that we have is increasingly concerned with the socialization of risk, then the idea that market control of this sort, as opposed to government control, enhances economic liberty se seems to me to be, uh, at the very least, a kind of misconception of what, what's going on. So that uh, 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 greater uh, control by the private sector, other things equal, uh, may be a good, but other things aren't always uh, equal. So the simple point here is simply that there are very different kinds of privatization, and that in evaluating them, you have to ask uh, comparative questions. Now, my second point uh, concerns just one domain in this uh, public-private spectrum, insurance. Uh, again, what I want to have to say here is intended to be a lot more positive than, uh, than normative. It's really in the form of a couple of hypotheses, which may in fact only fit the examples that I've chosen. Uh, when I look at, uh, uh, at the public-private spectrum of insurance, uh, I see a mixed system in which the redistributional motives that uh, George so uh, effectively pointed to play a larger role, obviously, in the public programs, uh, and a smaller one uh, in, the, uh, in the less public or the uh, private ones. And it seems to me that, the, that George has, in some sense, placed his finger right at the right point, because it was, uh, 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 I think that the redistributional motives that lie behind so many of these government insurance programs place a kind of limit on the feasibility of privatization. Now, again, I'm making that as a, as a positive, a descriptive rather than a normative. Uh, point. Uh, uh, in a way, George has very effectively refuted what are, uh, at least on the efficiency side, make weight arguments that are often given to support uh, the government insurance programs when, in fact, it's the, it's the redistributional uh, aims of them that are really the, the motive behind the program. More than that, I would say, um, there are two forces, I think, that are, uh, that are operating. I, I want to stress that these are hypotheses only. But uh, first, at least with respect to some programs, you can, you can observe an effort, at least sometimes, to structure things so that, to structure things so that an even more redistributional program uh, gets avoided. And secondly, although the camouflage isn't often very effective, there's often an effort also to camouflage the redist redistribution that's going on. And I think that both of these, uh, both of these uh, factors, these phenomena that you see in connection with these government programs, 
reflects what must be a kind of profound ambivalence that even the supporters of the program have about the redistribution. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, 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 public insurance programs like certain aspects of Medicare or the Social Security uh, Disability Insurance Program. Now, of course, these are heavily redistributional. Uh, but they're also partially contributory. There's a kind of mandatory risk spreading feature that's built into them that forces a contribution from some of the prospective uh, beneficiaries and therefore forestalls what might indeed be a demand for even greater redistribution if the program weren't partially contributory. Imagine, for example, uh, what the demands might be on public hospitals for the provision of free medical care if we didn't have Medicare uh, and what the demands on the public fisc in other ways might be if we didn't have Social Security disability insurance. Uh, that is, at least in some sense, the, uh, the um, mandatory nature of these programs is an effort to forestall even greater uh, redistributional uh, efforts. Uh, maybe this is what uh, uh, Bob Ellickson was referring to. I, uh, I'm imagining that if we didn't have these programs, there would be greater demands for greater uh, forms of redistribution. But perhaps uh, his anarchy point is simply that uh, if we did away with these programs, then more private forms of philanthropy would grow up, and I'll be interested in hearing what he has to say about that. Uh, but these programs also camouflage their redistributional elements to a certain degree by calling themselves insurance, uh, by making themselves partially contributory, and therefore by, uh, by, uh, 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 by doing that, uh, um, making the effort to, uh, to, to portray themselves as not entirely redistributional. Uh, and it seems to me that that, you know, that that element of these programs places a kind of practical political limit on, on the degree to which you could privatize them because it turns out that if you privatize them, uh, obviously, and you make, make uh, insurance voluntary, uh, it's not purchased by those who are, who are most the uh, objects of the, of the public program. If you make purchase mandatory, then you have to, you have to provide subsidies of some sort uh, to the purchasers in the private market who would not. Uh, there are in some states now in reaction to the medical malpractice crisis demands that medical malpractice insurance be more, more uh, based on uh, loss rates and less based on categorical concerns like the uh, uh, medical subspecialty that you belong to. And those are in some sense redistributional because uh, uh, in fact the market on its own would reach uh, a level of optimal classification uh, without any regulation, and therefore, statistically, it must be that, that the amount of uh, uh, the, uh, the probative value of a loss experience is already being taken into account in the classifications. If you demand more experience rating than, in fact, the market has already provided, what you're doing is not getting closer to what the real, uh, uh, the real uh, 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 level of risk posed by an individual is, but you're redistributing from uh, those who are unlucky enough to, uh, to have randomly caused accidents to those who are, not, who are more lucky and who don't have them. And, and that's a form of redistribution. Another form uh, is the, uh, the, the move that we've seen in some places towards unisex classification, the, the prohibition against uh, uh, classifications based on uh, gender. And that, too, is a kind of a redistribution. Um, uh, it varies whether the redistribution is from males to females or females to males because uh, women have higher risks in some areas and lower risks in others, the difference between pensions and life insurance, for example. Uh, and we see in connection with these kinds of regulations the same kind of ambivalence and the same kind of effort to camouflage. Uh, the, uh, the prohibitions on certain kinds of classifications are described uh, as as a, uh, efforts to uh, prevent the interference with rights rather than as a, as a subsidy, the, the mandating of subsidies running from one uh, class to another. And uh, if we were to do away with that kind of, a, kind of a camouflage, do away with that kind of hypocrisy, what we'd have to do is engage in a more obvious subsidy. The subsidized classes would have to be given money, uh, and that, that's, a, uh, that's something that even the proponents of the subsidy are ambivalent about, uh, at least so it seems to me. Uh, well, I don't draw profound lessons from this analysis, but it does give me a hunch that, uh, that even those who favor redistributions are themselves uh, uncomfortable. It may be that we could, uh, uh, and this is the hypothesis, hypothesis, I suppose, we could develop a, uh, a hypothesis that, that uh, uh, there's a tendency to arrive at the re least redistributional scheme that satisfies the aims of the proponents. Uh, sometimes that's government insurance, sometimes that may be regulation of private insurance that accomplishes a, a redistribution. But it also suggests to me, of course, that we're always trying to achieve too many things. Uh, 
Uh, Yogi Berra said that, uh, that baseball is 90% uh, mental and that the other half is physical. Uh, he is on, on most matters uh, a, a, a wise uh, old owl to be, uh, to be uh, paid attention to. And here I'd say that the insurance system, the overall insurance system as we have it, both including government insurance and private insurance, uh, uh, follows the, uh, the Yogi Berra observation. It's 90% uh, it's, uh, concerned with economic liberty and efficiency, and the other half is redistributional, and that's largely the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now entertain questions from the audience. Do I, oh, well, we'll have some response first. Uh, Peter, we'll, we'll call on you first and the... Uh, uh, a few unrelated points. When I got back to my seat, there was a uh, quite a stiff note from my neighbor, George Priest, uh, to the effect that I had defamed Ronald Coase. Uh, misread. Misread. Uh, he, literally, he did say misread. Now, I think I did not misread the article that I cited, which is the problem of social cost. I think uh, Coase was, in fact, very much on to the larger point I was making, which is uh, decentralized forces can give spontaneously uh, give rise to um, uh, quite a little interesting order. And he used the example of, of lighthouses, an empirical study he did, and whatever. So his larger uh, corpus of writing certainly uh, supports my point, and uh, he was on to the, uh, the he, he would not be surprised that the basketball players can uh, produce order without the state. Uh, I also neglected my talk to mention one particular legal doctrine, which I think is uh, in flux, that does, uh, is importantly in play to describe the, the, the scope of the public and private sectors, and that is the definition of state action for purposes of the 14th Amendment. Uh, where I encounter that in my own work is with whether homeowners associations that run condominiums, or other kinds of real estate developments are regarded as states for purposes of the 14th Amendment. If they are, they may have to have a one person, one vote rule. Uh, the substance of their architectural regulations may be subject to some sort of uh, substantive review. Their procedures may have to uh, comport with due pro procedural due process or something of that sort. Uh, my own view is that this is a, an area where in fact doctrine is fairly pliable. Uh, there are arguments in the law reviews both ways. My own view is this is definitely an area where uh, the court should refrain from characterizing these kinds of institutions as public because this gives rise to much uh, greater diversity of, of private arrangements in these kinds of matters. So this is a doctrine which is live and courts, in fact, uh, can, can change the rules. Um, let me say a little bit more about the, the anarchist point. The anarchists... Uh, um, to my surprise, they came across the, the anarchist scholars a few years ago, and I think of people like Pyotr Kropotkin and more currently Michael Taylor. I'd never run into these people before because they're kind of, they call yourself an anarchist, you're sort of taboo, I think, in all circles uh, these days, except a few anarchists themselves. Uh, what they mean by anarchy is not disorder. What they mean is the absence of a state, and that turns out to be an interesting situation. Uh, the early point that's been made by the anarchists all along is that if you have public provision of police, for example, which is the example they use, it is likely that people are less likely to organize to provide uh, Good Samaritan aid or something like that, that there will be a crowding out of private elamocenary efforts through state provision. Similarly, if you provide Social Security to the elderly, children will take care of their old folks less, less than they did before. It strikes me that this is demonstrably true. Uh, the size of the effects, I think, can be debated. But that was basically a good point, and we should, one we should keep in mind in making policy. Lastly, on the basic debate between uh, uh, Ken and, and George, uh, I do think of the relevance of what I call the Polinsky theorem, which is a description about to what extent low-level arrangements should be used to redistribute. And I call it the Polinsky theorem after my uh, colleague at Stanford, who has a nice description of this in terms of whether contract doctrine or tort doctrine, for example, should have a redistributive component. And, and he argues not on the grounds that those kinds of redistributions are always more efficiently made through broader tax and welfare policies. And I think the same point can be made about the inferiority of trying to redistribute income through uh, the niceties of insurance arrangements. Well, let me try this microphone, and uh, so we don't have too much time spent walking walking back and forth. Uh, I only wanted to address the this point that Ken Abraham made about the about the extent to which 
these various acti various governmental activities, all of which we're loosely putting under the realm insurance, and of course we're meaning something far greater than simply property casualty insurance, but, but Ken, Ken made the point, the extent to which these these activities have been justified as a because they are the most effective camouflage for redistribution, or perhaps in a stronger, if I can attribute a stronger point to him that I'm not sure he made, that this is in some way the easiest way to obtain uh, to obtain re redistribution. I think it's very hard to it is very hard in any public policy discussion to deal with arguments about camouflage. Uh, and uh, what is an appropriate camouflage and what isn't uh, an, effective, uh, an effective camouflage. But, but it seems to me that, that, that what we need to do and what has been begun, but I don't think it's been systematic enough, is to point out exactly how serious the losses are of, of the government provision of this very large range of, of, uh, of services. That is, I think that, it, that, uh, that, that it's well known that incomplete experience rating and workers' compensation those of you who read the workers' compensation literature uh, will know this, but uh, uh, that, that, uh, that incomplete experience rating leads to higher rates of, uh, higher rates of injury. Uh, but again, it seems, this seems to me, those of you who read this literature know that point, it's not well known and it's not well appreciated in, in more general public policy domains. But the point I'm trying to make is more, a more systematic one, that in every form of government provision of this type of service or where the government, where the provision by the government is justified on these grounds, the effects are perverse, not only in terms of efficiency effects, uh, but also in terms of the ultimate goal that, 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 is, that, that all of us and that even the, the supporters of the program are trying to promote, such as reducing the extent of defaults, not increasing the extent of defaults, reducing the extent of injury rather than increasing the extent of injury. It seems to me, even if at the, at the current moment, insurance is the most effective camouflage that, that uh, those interested, not so much in privatization, but simply in, in, uh, in defensible uh, government, uh, have to penetrate that, uh, that camouflage. And the more systematically this is done, the more likely it is, is going to be that, that, this, that, that we will see the same effects for these, this wide range of government uh, insurance activities as we've seen in the range of government regulatory activities. Uh, prior to the deregulation movement, everyone knew or was beginning to know that regulation had adverse efficiency effects, uh, but regulation was defended in terms of its redistributional effects, that the, the efficiency losses were outweighed by the effectiveness of using regulation to provide airline service to the, to the uh, uh, frontiers of, of the United States, including New Haven, of uh, providing, uh, providing other forms of services to people who, were, who weren't and wouldn't uh, pay for them. Uh, a, a, the, the, a set of academic studies penetrated that camouflage, and I'm promoting the same, uh, the same sort of thing here with regard to the government provision of insurance services. But I should say that it, that it is, uh, I haven't mentioned privatization in particular. This is privatization of a rather, that I'm recommending, or would, would recommend of, a, of, of quite a uh, more radical nature. Much of the privatization movement is, uh, is directed in terms of transferring transferring activities, uh, working out the sensible transfer of government activities to the private sector, such as by contracting out or, or selling off assets. It seems to me that my arguments compel the government simply getting out of the business altogether. That is simply dropping the, uh, the business altogether, uh, leaving it to the, to the market to, uh, to pick it up, as I'm sure the market, uh, the market would. But that's a stronger form of privatization, simply cold, hard withdrawal, than, than uh, trying to attempt the, the often difficult uh, legislative and contractual methods of shifting governmental activities in, in much their current form to a different set of, uh, of operators. Well, I, uh, I don't object to Bob's uh, invocation of what he calls the Polinsky uh, thesis. I think that's probably right. I was trying to describe some reasons why we don't do it that way. Uh, and uh, I think George is right. Who, what student of insurance could object to greater studies of the, uh, uh, the private insurance market's uh, uh, capacities? Uh, and I think, I think George is prob probably right to, to suggest that uh, we ought to look at the, uh, at the, uh, the effect of these redistributional aims on the, what, what I'll loosely call the, the sort of loss rate. Uh, I think, however, we need to, when we, when we start looking, to be a little bit discriminating. Uh, 
it, it's easy to cite the workers' comp example, which is a very good example of the adverse effects of that kind of redistributional aim. I think, however, that the, that the, uh, the effects of government insurance on, on, uh, on uh, other forms of activity aren't necessarily going to be so, so uh, uh, influential on the loss rate. Um, that is, the victim insurance as opposed to injurer insurance, uh, SSDI, uh, Medicare, other forms of, 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 of sort of alternatives to first party health and disability insurance, while undoubtedly because they're less effectively administered, uh, they, ha they are subject to greater moral hazard. The degree to which the, the moral hazard exceeds what would be found in the private market is unclear to me. And if the, uh, if the, if the, uh, the magnitude of the excess is not great, then the proponents of the redistribution have a stronger argument than, than uh, George suggests they do. And it seems to me, therefore, that that empirical question is one that would be important as we started to look uh, at, at domain after domain that's now uh, uh, the subject of government protection in which we might privatize. Peter, and then the next gentleman. Uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, address the issue of the uh, redistribution, redistribution element in uh, public insurance program. And I would submit that public insurance programs, in fact, are very poor uh, redistribution vehicles. And that including, in, uh, including redistribution within insurance results in both undermining redistribution goals and insurance goals. In other words, when you combine insurance and welfare in the same program, you get bad insurance and bad welfare. And, and uh, one example of this is, uh, or one reason for this is that you tend to uh, by including the, the welfare distributions in the insurance programs, you end up wasting a lot of funds. A lot of funds go to people who are not really poor or not really in need. And I think the Social Security program is one of the greatest examples of this. It has a lot of redistributive elements uh, in it. Uh, and uh, we've seen over the history that, uh, for example, government workers have been able to qualify for a lot of these redistribution programs that are looking for a small period of time uh, in, the, uh, in, in the private sector, or you have a lot of other provisions that are intended to help out people who are in need, such as, that, such as additional funds for uh, non-working spouses, the theory being that uh, uh, families who uh, work retire against non-working spouses need even more, more funds, when in fact uh, rich people have non-working spouses as well as middle-income people, and in fact the two uh, 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 families uh, with married couples and have higher incomes than single people, and I think uh, there have been some studies which have indicated that, uh, that on net this, the, these uh, uh, Redistribution elements have, in fact, it, it, it may have well done mostly for people who are not uh, really in need. The other, the other, uh, another problem with it is that they, the welfare elements tend to be financed by regressive taxes. So you're trying to have a semi-insurance program, so you try to have some kind of premium system, but a premium system tends to be a heavier burden on the lower-income part of the population. So again, it's a, it's a more, it seems to me, a poor way to run a welfare program. If you're going to have welfare uh, or redistribution of subsidies, you'll want to have a finance by program that has a tax burden that focuses more on the lower income people. The same thing with uh, on, on the insurance side, if you have a big redistribution element in the system, then your premiums are not going to be reflecting just risk, but in fact the redistribution is element. And in fact, one of the ways they, they do try to redistribute through some of these insurance programs is by giving the, the uh, premiums so that they're not sending a market signal reflecting just risk, but they have a big uh, added elements to them which are adding uh, uh, redistribution. And I think that the, the, the redistribution is hidden in these programs uh, uh, because, uh, in fact, it's a fear that they would, the redistribution would not be approved if uh, they were more explicit. It's not a way of keeping redistribution down by hiding them in these programs. It's a way of getting redistrib camouflaging redistribution and getting approved that the public might not approve otherwise. And I would think that any redistribution program ought to be explicitly designed for that uh, uh, goal, ought to be designed to go towards people who are only towards people who are in need, ought to be financed by the best mechanism, and ought to be explicitly done in a separate program, separate from insurance, so that the public could decide whether they would uh, support it. So appreciate your comment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, first of all, let me say I'm flipping around the room. I think I'm the only probably qualified that remembers when Social Security came in, I was there before it came in. In other words, I'm retired, I'm not an attorney, but I got my interest in the Constitution by having all the cases with the IRS and brought me all the way up to the Supreme Court without an attorney. And I come to find out how bad our government functions. And 
Sister Ellison brought it up when he went to talking about what is law instead of what the Constitution is. But I have found what they're teaching in some schools today is that we are working toward legal realism rather than constitutionalism. Now, rather interesting, this Thursday has to be in the library of looking at Washington's farewell address. And I'll read something that he said here. Very short. If, in the opinion of the people, the decision of distribution or modification of the constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by an amendment in the way the Constitution designates. But let there be no change by usurpation. For though this, is one in, though this in one instance may be the instrument of good, it is a customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. And then another one I ran into at the same time was one by Robert Mayer Hutchins, who I very recall was president of Chicago University. In 1974, he says, the death of democracy is not likely to be an assassination from ambush. It will likely be slow extinction from apathy, indifference, and undernourishment. And I want to say I'm ashamed of my generation, which is the one that has allowed this apathy and undernourishment to go on for the last 50 years. For example, the Constitution, particularly, very first sentence, the Constitution says all legislative powers are vested in the Congress, and even their acts cannot become law until they are passed by the President or the overriding veto. How can there be any such thing as common law, precedent law, or even case law? We've been talking here now for two days about the Supreme Court decision changing the Constitution. They're not allowed to do this. As we said, the Supreme Court cases are not law. They're just applications of the law and the fact facts in the case around. And I think that we finally get together and start getting back to a constitutional government. I found Professor Priest's remarks concerning insurance to be both fascinating and illuminating. And I was wondering if you would address yourself, Professor, to uh, the theoretical underpinnings, leaving aside for the moment the difficulty of uh, policy concerning uh, enforcement, the theoretical underpinnings of uh, the state's efforts, such as my state in Illinois, dealing with the problem of the uninsured motorists, where you're talking about the need to spread that risk throughout society at large by requiring, perhaps, a proposal, all motors must be insured, and the other in order to get old driver's license or license plates and fairly severe penalties if they go ahead and drive without a license because of this, mm -hmm. including jail time and things of that sort. And on the other hand, uh, the notion of requiring the insurance companies kicking and screaming at one of these the newspaper accounts to form some kind of insurance pool to deal with these people whom they would not otherwise want to sell insurance to, to sell insurance at a rather stiff rate uh, it's my understanding of perhaps uh, $1,500 to $2,000 a year, far in excess, at least in uh, Illinois, central Illinois, from uh, what the rate normally would be. And uh, I have uh, wrestled with this, trying to figure out what it means, and you, you seem to have touched upon many different aspects of this whole area, and I thought maybe you could address yourself to it for a moment. Uh, I don't know the details of the Illinois uh, plans by, by any means. Uh, surely, as I understand your discussion of the insurance requirement, as I view this requirement that all drivers be insured before they're licensed, it's an adjunct to the, the relief we give in our society to, uh, through bankruptcy uh, and uh, abolition of imprisonment for debt to individuals who, who uh, incur claims or debts that exceed their assets. Uh, it seems to me quite sensible, even compelling, in the context of, of uh, the use of an automobile, which, and maybe in uh, many other contexts too, where there is a very, uh, very uh, substantial uh, possibility for a driver to inflict injury on another person and, and, and uh, in which our society uh, wants uh, to, uh, to provide compensation to these victims by charging the negligent driver that uh, we require that the driver or the operator uh, or in other activities 
uh, demonstrate that they have the assets uh, available to, uh, to satisfy such judgments, thinking, or at least believing, that this justification, believing that the insurance companies then, in operating this insurance, will, will try and predict what the risk level is and charge these people appropriately for their driving, driving behavior. Now, uh, I alluded just briefly to the assigned risk pools uh, that, which are very similar to joint underwriting authorities in other states, which provide insurance uh, for uh, individuals who, who, who are turned down by auto carriers. There are, there are joint underwriting pools in medical malpractice and a, and a variety of other areas. And I think, again, this is a, this is a perfect example of, of uh, the, the type of policy that, that uh, I'm criticizing. Those assigned risk pools and joint underwriting authorities increase the rate of injury. Uh, there, it seems to me uncontrovertible that they that they uh, uh, provide. Sometimes these these, these activities uh, are justified in terms of redistribution. The claim that it's necessary in this society to have a car yeah. to be able to drive a car, and so even if you inflict injury wildly, but not criminally, uh, you're you're allowed to uh, allowed to continue. Uh, again, I think it's uh, I think there are uh, there are enormous numbers of grounds to uh, uh, strong grounds to oppose uh, such a policy, and that that the, uh, we may be seeing a movement uh, in that direction. Certainly the reaction to uh, the reaction of the recent uh, uh, drunk driving, uh, the, the opponents of drunk driving who have, who have been so effective in tightening up driving enforcement in this realm, I think should be turned to the assigned risk pools as their next, uh, as their next objective. Let me just add to that. I think the reason that the insurance companies object so much to these requirements is not so much the idea that, that individual liberty is being uh, uh, transgressed upon by requiring somebody to get insurance, but their fear, borne out in practice, that the state regulators would place a ceiling on the amount that can be charged any given driver, and that that ceiling will be, be below the amount that the market operating uh, 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 based only on loss probabilities would charge those drivers. The result is that even though a uh, driver assigned to an assigned risk pool is charged $1,500 or $2,000, he's undercharged, and that's why as George says, uh, those pools increase the loss rate. There's a kind of redistribution either from all uh, other drivers not in the pool to the assigned risk drivers or from the shareholders of the insurance companies to the assigned risk drivers. And that's what the objection is. It's not so much the, at least on the part of the, the companies, and it's not so much to the idea that they're being forced to insure, but that the probability is they'll be forced to insure at a rate lower than they wish to charge. Can I just add one thing to that? I think the I think the redistribution goes further. There's a redistribution here from victims to, and this is the independent point I was trying to make, the moral point I was trying to make. In these assigned risk pools, there's redistribution from victims to to risky drivers because no one would believe that the the, the personal injury suffered in an automobile accident is is totally compensable in any in any uh, realistic way. That is, damages can't compensate for mutilation, and, and to the extent that individuals' lives are substantially affected, in many cases ruined, in many cases terminated, by, the, by accidents uh, caused by these people, we have a very severe form of redistribution that goes beyond uh, the, the, level of, the relative levels of insurance premiums charged to one uh, a driver classified in one way or another. My name is Gabriel Rell. I'm interested in privatization. I wonder if I could take the discussion uh, uh, outside of the insurer business and maybe open up a wider uh, question, which is uh, the relationship of the law or the Constitution to competition in the provision of public services. Uh, because a lot of privatization is involved not only with the transfer of activities from uh, government to the private sector, but also with having more choice and more competition. Uh, just to illustrate my point, I want to ask about the, um, the legal aspect of the regulation, say, of public transport, let's say, taxes, taxi cabs. Now, I assume that if a county, Montgomery County, were to decide that only giant food or only Safeway would be allowed to sell food in the county, uh, that this would be illegal. I'm not sure, and this is really my first question. Uh, can local authorities stop economic activities uh, of, uh, say, grocery companies? 
uh, but they certainly can stop economic activities, say, of transport providers or taxi cabs. Uh, in Montgomery County, there is a limit to the number of, of, of licenses. Uh, this is so in many cities. This has caused uh, the prices of medallions to reach lowest levels. I believe over $100,000 in New York, uh, over $50,000 in Atlantic City, and so on. Uh, I know of many cases of people who want to provide public transport and who are not allowed to do so without getting the permission of the authorities, uh, even when they can provide safe vehicles and safe drivers. I am not quite sure the rights of local authorities to uh, look at the sanitary practices of people who sell food or at the safety practices of people who drive vehicles. So really my question is, is there anything that can be done either in local, state, or federal law which would make it um, more difficult uh, to allow uh, states and local authorities to give exclusive contracts uh, to people to provide certain services? Uh, I think very often for many of the things that you don't like in the world, a good thing to do is to go into politics and to work on the legislative side and repeal ordinances that you don't like and change uh, state legislation. Uh, I think that's advice I would give to uh, the Planned Parenthood League and I would give it to uh, staunch libertarians who would take every issue into court. That is, there is, uh, I would encourage more lobbying of that sort. I'll give an example. I happen to know some things about Montgomery County. Montgomery County through its zoning ordinance has a conditional use permit that requires a finding of need for the new activity. Uh, I know it's applied to service stations. And there's a famous uh, Maryland case where somebody wants to open a service station on Rockville Pike uh, and all the existing service station proprietors come in and they say, gee, we don't need another station. We can still do more business. Uh, sustained by the uh, Supreme Court of Maryland uh, as a uh, legitimate exercise of the police power. One way to attack that, I happen to think that decision is wrong on the facts, and that one way to attack that is through litigation. Another way is to uh, 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 repeal that ordinance and to elect people uh, to run Montgomery County who don't uh, have an ordinance of that sort. And I would encourage that sort of behavior. I'd like to take up Professor Ellison on his provocation, which I was led by. Um, I think it's good that we should discuss basic questions here. And I'd like to first try to clarify a word. The achievement of the federalist movement and the Constitution was to establish the Constitution as the supreme law of the land, and therefore the Constitution of the United States, the fundamental text. And those who are against that are known not as federalists, but as anti-federalists. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, think, what I think you really propose is to take a certain minority that's group into a separate society that would be called the anti-federalist society. <laughs> and I think that would make a very interesting discussion here. But I would like to add that while that's a charming deviation, if you'll admit, nevertheless, it comes at a high cost because any oath of office in the United States is to the Constitution and to uphold the Constitution. And those who are against the Constitution, after all, cannot take such oaths in an entirely good faith. So I would like people to ponder that the 50 point go a 50 far. Now, your fundamental theoretical point to justify it is that property exists without government. That, of course, is true. In fact, the market exists without government. The problem is that it's only customary property and customary transactions that exist without government. A free market and secure and transferable property exist only with government. It is government, liberal and enlightened government, to be sure, which frees the market. Uh, Lionel Robbins, the great expositor of classical liberalism, along with Hayek and the London School of Economics, pointed this out. He said the classical liberals relied upon a centralized government to overcome the local feudal wars. They did not rely upon education or even the example that one lord might set a free trade to persuade all the others to free their markets. And that the reason why the market is not free on the international scale to work on is because we have these great feudal barons of the national states which continue to upset the market because there is no international framework of the free market. So I would suggest, and the counterpoint to your suggestion, that if the Federalist Society is serious about spreading economic freedom and the free market, it will take up the problem of freeing the market on the international scale. And we'll take up the proposal of President Reagan a year ago that the economic constitution of the world must be rewritten 
and it will set to drafting an economic constitution of the world. Let me respond. I am. Uh, I am not. Ag I think there was a phrase in there that I somehow I am against the Constitution. Um, uh, <laughs> as I think the speaker will recognize, I am. What I am in favor of is a is pluralism in our institutions. Uh, that means it's, I think it's. I'm delighted that the framers got together and passed the federal Constitution. It is not the only source of authority. I would also remind you that in fact state constitutions are extremely rich documents which law students don't learn hardly a thing about in law school. Article one, section one of my, the California Constitution, for example, grants the right to hold property. And I'm not sure how, that, you know, how we should construe that. I don't know the history of it, but it may be that there's a rationale for uh, protection of economic rights there. All I'm saying is the Federalists might get interested in those kinds of clauses. Similarly, I regard custom as uh, uh, not the exclusive source of property rights. I, have, I totally agree it is a frail uh, ultim uh, uh, frail source if it is the only source, but it, uh, in some context, I think it is a superior source to uh, legal alternatives. Yes, Judge. Sure, I was very uh, interested in your paper and heard you uh, carry it forward. I think uh, uh, there's an implication that uh, you may want to develop uh, that transcends the purely, uh, as you're attempting to do, purely economic consequences. Convention the provision of insurance. <clears throat> in, the, um, in the efforts of, this, of the state to either provide insurance or regulate insurance providers, uh, one often finds the origins that lay in what looks like a plausible market uh, sort of story, uh, for instance, taking capital from small depositors and investing it in, in uh, sometimes risky investments, uh, but it's very large aggregate sums. Arguably difficult, although I don't buy the argument, arguably difficult for a private market to provide deposit insurance. And from there, one is often running, and you find 30 years later that the deposit insurance rationale has now been trans extended to the point where the activities of the institution are regulated in great detail in order to control exposure of, of the state enterprise to risky activities. That, that rather conventional sequence of the organic growth and extension of regulation has a more frightening application, I think, when the insurance risk undertaken is one that deals with the, let's say, the bodily integrity of citizens. And if you take the example of, for instance, <coughs> Medicare or any other medical insurance program, you see that likewise there, the state becomes something like a common stockholder, i.e. a residuary interest holder, in your body. So that if you harm yourself or are harmed, the state pays. And therefore, the state has an interest in preventing you from harming yourself or being harmed. Now, the, the, the final step of that process is the enactment of legislation that is designed to prevent you from harming yourself, such as a requirement that if you're a motorcyclist, you wear a helmet, or that if you're a, a member of a particular sect, religious sect, of snake handling practices, that you, that you uh, uh, fix the snake in some way, uh, uh, or uh, um, other of these uh, of these statutes that have been enacted, which are in in uh, an actual purpose, I think, as a political matter, purely paternalistic in the sense that they are really directed purely at the uh, at, at trying to impose the, the risk averseness of the majority on the this preference of the motorcycles and the snake handling. But when they've gotten to the courts, which the state courts have divided thus far over these statutes, there are about half a dozen cases about the motorcycle helmets. The ones that have upheld the, the statutes have uniformly done so, and indeed the others that have rejected have rejected on the same ground, but they have, they've upheld on the ground that the state has validly argued that it has an interest in preventing the injury, the head injury of the motorcycles, because Statistically, it can show most of those motorcyclists will incur hospital costs, which will be shifted in large part to the insurance fund maintained by the state. And so you start with very modest beginnings, and you end up being a chattel owned by the state, a, a, an entity whose residual, residual interest in which has been alienated somewhere else. I think it's an unfortunate uh, uh, implication. I hope you can develop it in your Thanks. Thanks, 
Uh, it's a very good, very good point you're making. In fact, to, to make the point only more general, I think it's hard to find any grounds for supporting these forms of activity, uh, these forms of governmental activity. There's certainly no efficiency grounds. The, the market failure arguments, is, as you point out, as you go through these fields one by one, they're totally implausible, if not just ludicly, ludicrously ridiculous. The, the, the best explanation, for example, of social security in the economics literature today is that young people, young workers, have a hard time marketing human capital because it's undeveloped and no one can predict it and the like. And therefore, a social security system, uh, one can justify a social security system that provides massive redistribution from the aged who have well-developed human capital to the young who have undeveloped uh, human capital to correct this market failure. Now, that's a, it's an interesting argument, but of course, if you look at Social Security, it's exactly the opposite. It, it operates in exactly the, the opposite way. But I think, I think that your, your uh, personal uh, integrity and personal liberty grounds, is, uh, moral grounds, is another, uh, is, is another important objection to these forms of, of activities. In fact, I have had a hard time finding any justification, economic, moral, uh, or, or uh, uh, in any form, to uh, to these activities and uh, uh, and it, it seems to me this has to be uh, has to be brought out and made more prominent. I think we've finished with our time. You can ask your questions. You can ask your questions uh, privately. Uh, the the banquet location will be downstairs in the second floor lobby. There are a few tickets for the banquet available for sale, and if you are interested, see. And Daron at the registration desk. In conclusion, I would like to express our thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities for the support for this symposium in honor of the bicentennial of the U.S. Constitution, and to thank Dean Henry Manny, Associate Dean Steve Eagle, uh, Assistant Dean Mark Hoberman, Eugene Meyer, the Executive Director of the Federalist Society, and the group of people listed in the back of your program who have made this particular symposium a success. Thank you all for joining us.